Oh, man, that's enough. Well, that's enough to give you real Freudian problems. I understand that the Freud, uh, you know, deals with a lot of these problems like that. That's a. Does that would that be included in the the general field of toilet training? Would it at all? I'm just just asking a, a philosophical question. I think so. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, don't, I'm not inventing the news. Don't get mad and turn Shepard off because he's in bad taste. Life is in bad taste. If that, you know, what are you going to do? By the way, speaking of bad taste. Uh, uh, I, uh, last week, of course, we did our annual worm show, and I've uh, been receiving letters from worm fans all over the eastern seaboard who recognize in the worm, the common earth worm, uh, who recognize in this uh, small creature of the, uh, you know, of one of our brothers on the earth, uh, he, they recognize in this creature one of nature's noble creatures. Now, I personally, uh, you know, I'm great worm fan, and I'm delighted to see that other people share it. I really am. I'm pleased. I thought for years I was, you know, a loner in that. But I discovered that other people walk around and they see a worm, you know, walking along the street there, and uh, in the rain or something like that. And, you know, they don't they don't say eek a worm or anything like that. They just salute him, say hi, and, he, you know, the worm goes his way. And nobody, to my knowledge, has ever been bitten by an earthworm. Uh, no, the earthworm... He, he seems to have been created for one purpose, and that is to catch bluegills and crappies. And, uh, of course, uh, he's at his happiest when he's being put on a hook. He's reaching, uh, this is the ultimate of his career. Now, a lot of people get a little queasy about that, but you must understand that, the, for example, the lobster. Lobsters, I've had friends who are deep-sea divers and all that stuff. They see lobsters. They say lobsters brood, and they're bugged a hell of a lot until they finally reach a seafood restaurant on 43rd Street in New York. They get put in that tank. It's showbiz. Uh, they're on their way. They're in the big town, the Big Apple. And you know that moment when the waiter reaches in there and grabs this lobster out? This is a debut. It's a big moment. Can you imagine how it feels to a lobster when the waiter reaches in, grabs him, pulls him out, everybody's watching, they bring him over to the table and you say, no, not that one. That's worse than, I'm telling you, that's worse than being in a one-night show that gets bombed out of town by Walter Kerr, you know. And that quite often they said to the lobster, when we turn to the tank, we'll brood and turn up its toes and say, forget it. I mean, if I can't make it in this town after the tank, I don't want to go on. You know, it's, this is what, you know, this is the expression. Have you ever heard the expression, uh, Charlie took the tank? You know what taking the tank means? You don't. Well, that means, uh, that's another way to say, uh, you, you know, you give up. Like a fighter, you know, fighters out there in the third round, all of a sudden you wonder why, uh, with a minute and a half to go in the third round, all of a sudden he's sitting on his bottom, and nobody really hit him. That's taking a tank. You know, he knows what's going to happen if he comes in for the fourth round, you know. He ain't going to have to fake it the next time. You know, there's going to be one zap, and the next thing you know, a cloud of dust, and he's looking up at the lights as quick as that. It's three weeks later. But, uh, so you take the tank. I mean, I don't know how many of you out there are planning to take the tank or how many already took the tank. I mean, <laughs> I always have a feeling that anybody listening to me on Saturday night is taking the tank. I mean, you ought to be out doing something really constructive, you know, like, like wrecking your life or, <laughs> you know. <laughs> By the way, uh, you know, speaking of, uh, of uh, taking a tank and all that stuff. Uh, uh, I, the only reason I bring up the worm show again tonight is that I have to bring up a little footnote to the uh, the whole story of the worms. As you know, I got in the last week. I talked about how I became a entrepreneur. At uh, you know, I was at the age of twelve or so, and I became the biggest worm man in my part of the state, which is in northern Indiana. And uh, boy, I had guys coming from all over, from Illinois. I had some guys come from Wisconsin to buy worms. And, uh, you know, when you start branching out like that, uh, you know, it's a kind of heady experience. Well, I read an article in Popular Mechanics, and uh, which is uh, kind of a science fiction magazine, actually. And, uh, yeah, it is. Uh, it really is. And so I'm reading this article in Popular Mechanics. We always read it. The only magazine I remember my father having a subscription to that uh, you guys come from families, you know, where your father reads uh, New Republic and reads stuff like The Nation and all that, you know, the real intellectual magazines. Well, my father was a was a lifelong subscriber to Popular Mechanics. He uh, he loved Pop. I, I love it, too. I, I uh, 
even to this day when I see Poppin Mechanics on the stand, you know, there's Playboy, there's Poppin Mechanics, there's Guts, the new male magazine, and, uh, you know, there's a, the new underground magazine, uh, you know, I can't tell you the name of that one, but there they are. The, uh, and uh, what do you think? The first thing, immediately I feel a little sweat coming, popping out of my neck when I see the newest issue of Popular Mechanics. You see, it says, the new one-wheel car inside, rocket-powered. It's the car of your future in these garish colors. You know. Of course, none of that stuff ever comes true. The one thing you got to understand about Popular Mechanics are continually predicting things which never occur. And, uh, of course, because most people don't really believe the future is ever actually going to come, you know. And so a guy sent me a copy of Popular Mechanics here recently that was exactly, it was printed exactly 25 years ago. And uh, they were making a prediction for the way the world would be in 1970, which 25 years ago, uh, I mean, seemed like, like, you know, predicting about life on Venus. I mean, uh, if I'm going to sit here and tell you about life in the year 20. 40, or let's say the year 2010, that seems so remote in the future that you can't believe it'll ever happen, you know. Well, he sent me this copy of Popular Mechanics, and it says, uh, the fantastic, unbelievable, great life of 1970 predicted in this issue. Well, there it was on the cover. You know how the world looked in 1970, according to Popular Mechanics? For one thing, they had all, there were no traffic problems by 1970. By the way, this is something that guys have been predicting since 1902. But there were no traffic problems because by 1970, everyone would travel all over the country on 250 mile an hour monorails. And uh, yeah, it would take them zap, you know, when you're in Philadelphia, you know, whap like that. And uh, they were beautiful. They they had even drawings. This is artist drawing inside, the fold out drawing of how the monorail would look. And here you see these elegant looking guys, strangely enough, wearing high celluloid collars. I don't know. It was a kind of a dichotomy there, but they, they were all standing around, elegant-looking guys with uh, with these two-tone floor shine shoes, you know, the brown and white shoes with the long cigarette holders, right out of a Fred Astaire movie, you know. And they're all standing around what looked like the bar or something. I was really impressed, you know. And it seemed to me that there were only about 10 or 11 guys in this thing, so elegant and the ladies in long gowns, and they were looking out. And they were looking out of the window, and they had this big, beautiful panoramic window, and you could see the country outside of what it was like, going to be like in 1970. Well, the country was rolling majestic green hills dotted here and there by beautiful Frank Lloyd Wright houses. I mean, very, very widely spaced with uh, streams flowing between them. And uh, you could see people, each house had behind it, it had a little round thing with a uh, one-man uh, commuter helicopter there, see. And it was all electrically operated helicopters, by the way, which could be learned to be driven by anybody uh, who, you know, could, was ambulatory. Anybody uh, who had an IQ over that of, say, a cocker spaniel could learn to fly one of these things, no problem at all. Totally safe, and uh, what a great world. And I read this, and I said, oh, boy, jeez, I wish I lived in 1970. And then I thought, hey, it is 70. Uh, what the hell? And I looked around, and it's 70, and I could see the crud drifting down the beer cans and the cigar butts and gigantic traffic jam and the 30 cabs and cars, not a monorail in sight, you know, not a green hill in sight. And I said to myself, well, you know, uh, maybe I'm living in the wrong place. You see, uh, they, they don't show that part of it in 1970. But then I realized when I'm reading it, it says this was a projection, a projection of how Manhattan Island would be in 1970. They predicted by 1970 that we would be, have such fantastic systems of communication and transportation, that they wouldn't need roads anymore. All roads would disappear. And, of course, the land then would become beautifully landscaped. All that, you know, you know how Sixth Avenue used to stay. Well, if you can imagine them just knocking down Sixth Avenue, just taking it away, and just letting a nice stream flow there, see, and uh, birds would come, and, uh, oh, you know, it was utopia. And I'll tell you, that uh, I, I mean, just a great, great vision of the future. And, of course, it was a scientific magazine, so you could actually believe it, you know, the because they had blueprints of it in there with the dimensions, you know, 12 feet, 3 inches, uh, ratchet, and, uh, ratchet goes into here, you know, and it says on the top, it says, this is cantilevered and dove-legged into this. And if you make the details reasonable enough, the people will believe anything, friends. <laughs> anything. Either that, the converse, if your generalizations are great enough, people will believe that too. 
So uh, you find that most people that are utopians believe only generalizations. They say, well, love is going to come after we blow up the world. See, to, to get a better world, I mean, you got to blow up the old one. See, this is one of the great rationalizations. And you say, what's going to happen after that? Well, of course, then, then people will be free to love one another. It's a... And uh, somehow you feel that somebody should play a violin, a gypsy violin behind that line, you know, played by a Hungarian, you see, in a bad restaurant over on East 48th Street someplace, you know, a guy named Stash or, uh, you know, Yannick or something. Hey, did you hear me talk Hungarian the other day? Listen, I, just once in a while, uh, you know, I'm, I'm living in a town, you know, where anybody who's elegant who goes to a restaurant, he talks French. Well, I don't speak any French at all, except though I have a few. You know, I'm pretty good at faking a few words like, uh, well, I say avec once in a while. I, you know, just throw that in, or I'll say uh, a merci. That's pretty good. I just learned last year that the C is, is pronounced that way. I used to say murky. And, uh, yeah, well, people used to say, what do you mean? I don't see nothing in the glass. They'd hold it up. And I meant, you know, I meant merci at that. I'm sorry. I'm telling you what life is about. I know it's bad. I know you don't like. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, all right, if you want to hear a really funny show, listen to Gambling. He's really funny. Boo, boo. <laughs> well, anyway, I'm very quiet when I go to French restaurants. You know, if you, if you want to be really honest about that, never try to fake a foreign language in a restaurant. That, that you know, that uh, that's bad news. And, the, you know, you, you go into a Spanish restaurant and you say, Yo, no, you say something like, uh, oh, uh, uh, come esta? And, uh, you know, he comes up to you. Uh, the, the next thing you know, your lab will be having whipped cream and goat's eyes, you know, so be careful. So, uh, I would suggest that you don't try to fake it. So, but the other day, see, I, I comes into Sardis and here's this elegant head waiter and he's Hungarian. Well, I didn't think much about it and he comes over to me and he says, uh, hello, he says, uh, he says, you are, you are seated here. And I said, yes. You know, they they have a, a, a sort of an odd accent. It's a kind of rolling, and so I sat down. And I said, uh, "Yes," and uh, and uh, he laughed. And I said, "What are you laughing?" He said, well, "This is a Hungarian trade, you know." And uh, oh, I said, "Yo, I did Kevana Kedvish." He flipped. Well, we exchanged obscenities in Hungarian for about five minutes. I thought oh, it's amazing how his his uh, sophistication stripped off, and I realized that he was just a. You know, like any other Hungarian named Geza or Stash. And, uh, you know, it was great. You know, all of a sudden, he just didn't eat. He wound up great. So he said, you speak a Hungarian. I said, not really. Only uh, what's necessary to get by in, in a bad neighborhood. So uh, <laughs> it was a great moment for me. You know, and I, I, did, I, I stopped right there, you see. And everybody was impressed all around me, you see. Uh, they, they really were impressed. So now, if a, if a Hungarian play is ever done on Broadway, I may get a reading. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. Nothing worse than a Hungarian play. Now, let's see. We got a commercial here. If you're the kind of person who gets a kick out of driving, and I hope a few... You know, that's not such a... That's not such a... That really, in a way, is a leading statement. You know, very few people really enjoy the act of driving. They. Uh, this is a special guy, really. I love to drive, personally. I, the, the whole idea of just driving is... Just a, I enjoy it. It's exciting to me. I love driving. Uh, going wherever you're going is to me secondary. I just, you know, it is. I just love to go. And if you like driving, I would like to recommend that you take a careful, long, hard look at the Datsun before you pop for a tin can this year. Uh, no, I'm serious because this automobile is a true engineer's creation. It's not uh, not designed by guys who design costume jewelry when they're moonlighting. It's uh, no, it's it's a real automobile. It's got uh, fully independent rear suspension, for example, has front disc brakes, and uh, they really hang in there. It's a great car for cornering. It's 96 horsepower overhead cam engine, and it's extremely inexpensive. It's four on the floor, synchro mesh transmission. It's a great little car, and they make a fantastic little semi, a little pickup truck. You ever see that little Datsun pickup? It's like a little jewel. So uh, if you're looking around for a car, you look up the Datsun, you, and if you decide against it, at least you won't feel bad, you know, when you see one on the road, know that you really loused up again. So if you're in Jersey, in Hawthorne, you can see it at Tom O'Brien's Imported Cars on Lafayette Avenue, or in Hempstead at 185 Main Street, that's Hempstead out on the island. Uh, is it time for a break yet? 
Yeah, I don't think so. Now, I, I want to finish this, though, about this worm thing, because I want to clear this up. A lady wrote me a note. She says, look, that worm story you told, and she sent me a story from from the paper. She says, that sounded like Homer's uh, Homeric legend, people digging for worms. And she sent me some story from the New York Times about a guy catching worms by sticking uh, uh, a, a generator, the two... Uh, the two uh, poles from a generator and cranking the generator, one of these crank-type generators, and the worms come up. Well, listen, baby, you're talking to one of the very first guys who experimented with that technique. Yes, sirree. That's giving the, uh, it's actually the electro electronic worm hot foot. And uh, the way it works, I'm, you know, I'm, at this point, I'm digging worms, see? And uh, I'm really working them hard. I'm, 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 Every week I'm out there with the shovel and the spade, and I got Schwartz and Flick working for me, and I got a whole little thing going, see? And worms were getting scarce. I mean, you know, as it gets hotter in the weather and the, and the uh, temperature gets up there and the uh, humidity goes up, or down, rather, and it gets dry in the middle of summer up in the Midwest, the worms go 250 feet deep. I mean, they really do. They start digging for China, you know? And uh, to, to, to get worms, you would have to dig a hole six feet deep, and then you get one or two little skinny ones because they're living in the suburbs, you see, those worms. And then you get deeper and deeper to plenty, you get to the real worms, they're about 10 feet deep. Well, it gets to be a drag. So I'm sitting in the in the library one day, and here's the newest popular mechanics. And there's a whole article in there. It says, new magic way to get worms every time you go for worms when you're going fishing. And they had this thing, an outline and a diagram on how if you took a Ford spark coil, you know what a Ford spark coil is? A Ford spark coil, and you connected three dry cells in series to the uh, primary of this spark coil. Then you took the secondary, and making sure, of course, that it was, it was pretty well insulated, you took the secondary of this and ran two long wires, and you put it 12 and a half feet apart. I remember the dimensions, 12 and a half feet apart. And on the end of each one of these wires, you were to attach a three-foot length of copper tubing that was sharpened on one end. You got it? You stuck both of these electrodes in the ground, and you, man, the, you know, it was unbelievable with the worms. So, I said to myself, that sounds great, you know? I'm always looking for new ways to, to uh, after all, the Industrial Revolution was last week, and, uh, you know, we might as well get on a stick and start using machines and cocks and the, the lever principle and uh, electronics and the whole bit. And since I'm working in the worm field, uh, I mean, might as well use that to enlarge and, and develop the scope of my business. So I went down with Flick on this fateful Saturday to go to the junkyard to look for a Ford spark coil. Well, you can find these. You, really, you can still find them, you know. So we're walking around in this junkyard, and there's 42,000 uh, radiators piled up. And uh, how many times? You know, one of the curious things I notice about New York you walk around New York, especially in the village. I live in the village. And you know, there's piles of stuff piled up out in front of the apartments. Now, sometimes it doesn't move for years, you know. But nevertheless, it's piled up there. See, theoretically, somebody's supposed to come and pick it up, right? Okay. Well, you know what I've noticed? How many times have you walked past a, 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 a place where there's a lot, you know, you know, garbage and stuff like that, and they have thrown out a sink or a jar? Now, that fascinates me. Never in my life have I thrown a sink away. Nor have I bought a new sink. You know, I always accept the sink that it's there, you know. And I and when I move out, I leave the sink there. I don't get in a you know, fit of rage and throw the sink out the window. But there's always sinks. Who are these people who keep throwing sinks away? And what do they do after they throw the sink? Do they go out of Sears and buy a new sink? Is that it? Or do they just give up water? Now, in the village, that's probably closer to the truth, you know. But uh, I'm curious about the Johns. So, and I saw a John today, beautiful John. I, you know, it was such a beautiful John. I thought, gee, I might take that home, you know. It was a great one. You know, build a TV into it or something. You know, you never know. Uh, you know, you know, symbolic, you know, and all that stuff. Uh, speak, that reminds me, this is WOR. It's funny how the connection is. This is WOR, New York. And uh, nevertheless, uh, <laughs> yeah, I can build a, you know, a little AM radio in there as it comes out. So uh, do you know that you can do that? I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something very embarrassing. I really shouldn't do this. But I know a guy. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> Shh. 
<laughs> well, uh, I better not. I won't tell you this, but you know one of the worst practical jokes that, that I know of, one of the worst practical jokes that I know of involved a very prominent piece of plumbing uh, from the, uh, let's say, the private room in the house. And this guy was an electronic cuckoo, and he worked up a, a the way he used it, he had a, a switch built into this thing. So when this thing was used, strangely enough, a voice would come on <laughs> from the back, you know, inside in the back where the, where the, where the, where the ball cock and all that stuff is. When you, when you are using this thing, all of a sudden this voice would start, would start moaning inside. Oh, oh, oh. That's all it said. Oh, 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 oh. Well, of course, you know, this is a kind of a bad scene. The guy gets up and he looks around and he, who's, you know, because it was beautifully done. He had a, good, a beautiful speaker and all that. And it was totally concealed. You, you concealed. You couldn't figure out where it came from. Well, of course, there was always a brief moment of panic in there. And the guy says, well, it must be in the next apartment. I probably, oh, I can't. This is I, nothing here. I can't be. Well, the next thing you know, he goes back in action. And, ah, 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 ah. We go like that. Well, you know what he used to do? He used to do this when there was a big party. So people would hear, <laughs> they'd hear, oh, oh, and <laughs> invariably the guy would come out of the job and somebody would come up and say, are you all right, Fred? Because they could hear these loud moans and yelling. <laughs> I think that is a terrible, terrible, now I'm just telling you what life is like, friends out there, so don't, uh, you know, I'm not, don't blame me, I didn't invent it. <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, life could be in such bad taste. I'm, I'm offended. I'm, you know what I'm doing? I'm reporting to this to you as a public service to, 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 to tell you that uh, it's a public service, you see, to, to warn you that you may be the victim of a callous, evil trick like that by people who are basically sadistic and rotten. So this is a public service. It's a, so don't say it's in bad taste. It is not. It's a public service. No, no, I believe that public service sometimes has got to tell, you know, the way it is. You know? Well, all right. So, <laughs> all right. Now, uh, me and, I just have to think of this, you see, because we were down at this uh, junkyard, me and Flick, looking for this spark coil. So we went out. I said, I love to go to junkyards to look for stuff. See, I'm building a car or something like that. I used to build cars. Me and Flick and Schwartz built about 20 cars. So whenever you're down, you know, you look at all this stuff. You see all these great things, and half of them, are, are completely mysterious. You know, a tremendous-looking machine with all kinds of nozzles sticking out of it. And you'd ask the guy, what is it? He said, I don't know, it's a machine. And you, we, there was a we, guy we called the Greek. And uh, he was called uh, Nick the Greek, actually. And he, yeah, he was. He was Nick the Greek, ran this uh, junkyard. And he, we'd come in, we'd say, hey, Nick, you got any uh, Ford spark coins? Well, yeah, hey, you'll go look at a Ford, well, you'll look at a Ford spark and call yourself. And we'd go out and start looking at the, you know, he didn't want to mess with it. So we would find these great machines, like tremendous machines, like eight feet high with nozzles sticking all over it and, and, and the big meters and stuff. And Schwartz wanted to buy one of these one time. So he goes back and he says, uh, how much is the, what is this thing down here, Nick? Well, you, well, you, well, you want to buy them? You want to buy the machine? And the Schwartz says, yeah, I'm thinking of buying it. What is it? Well, you, know, you don't know, you don't, you're not, you're not even to know what is this about and you want to buy it? And the, you know, that's a bad Greek accent, but he was a bad Greek. Uh, it may surprise you to know that some Greeks who are working the Greek scene are really not from Greece. They're actually from Hegwish, Illinois. And so they have a very bad Greek accent, although, you know, uh, they get by, you know, when the, when the guys, when the dill docks come in from Indianapolis, they can confuse them, see. So, nevertheless, we're walking around this, this junkyard that we came across a whole pile of transmissions and stuff, and, and there's a pile of spark coils. Now, the trick is to get one that isn't burned out. You see, that's, that's not uh, not easy. So we're looking and rooting and grubbing, and we got a, a little ohm meter, volt ohm meter, that we got from Allied Radio. So we're checking them back there. And Nick sees us. He sees us with this meter. He said, what are you doing? You're, 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 playing, you're, you're burning out to my coils. And the Schwartz says, no, we're using the coils to see whether they're burned out. That's, that's what I see. You're burning them out. To... Well, anyway, after a lot of yelling and fist fighting, Schwartz said, well, we had to kick him in the stomach, actually. We finally got this spark coil. You know, Greeks are very emotional. So we, we got the spark coil. We paid 30 cents, I believe, something, which was outrageous because the going price was about 15. And, you know, after we hit him and all, we figured we had to do it. So 
we bought the spark coil. We took it home, and we took it down to the basement, down to my basement. Now, I had a bunch of, a bunch of uh, dry cells down there. See, so I connect the dry cells in series. I had about 10 dry cells. And, you know, you get pretty good voltage when you take a whole bunch of dry cells and connect them in series. And so I put them all in series, and I had these two wires, and I connected it to the primary of this spark coil. Immediately, it goes, it starts to hum, you see. The little transformer home in there is great. It was working. So Schwartz says, uh, let me try this thing, see. So he's going to short the secondary to see whether, you know, he's getting anything out. So he gra- he's very anxious. He grabs it. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, have you ever seen a guy's teeth glow? They were green. It was fantastic. I, I-, I think it has something to do with a tartar. See, it was dark in the basement down there, and they fluoresced. I never saw a teeth. It was like a TV tube lit up his teeth. And his eyeballs were popping out, and, and Flick said one thing. He says, it works. So we knew that the transformer worked. And uh, the following part of the story, I'm going to give you a warning, is a pretty sickening story. And I don't want, the, you know, I don't want people who are nervous to listen to it. It's a very sickening story because of what happened with that machine. So we took it out to the backyard, my backyard, a lot of weeds. We didn't really have a backyard. We had a bunch of weeds back there, see, and, and uh, you know, it's just a, you know, a real crummy backyard, a lot of weeds, and the, there was old tin cans and stuff. So we go out in the backyard, and I said, all right, Schwartz, I'm going to stick this thing in here, and uh, we'll measure it off 12 and a half feet, and I'll stick it on the other side and see what comes out. It's supposed to be the worms come out. So I stick it down, and Schwartz sticks it down. So we got back up on the porch, and we pressed the switch. We took a, actually what we were using for a switch was a button, the kind of button you get in the dime store for doorbells. You know, it's a press button, see? So we pressed down on the button, the transformer goes, it was a fantastic sight. All the weeds and everything out there suddenly stood upright. I'm telling you, it was fantastic. It was like, it was like we had charged one little part of the earth with a supercharging charge of static electricity and that's actually what we had done you see so you see this weeds are moving like that and we just held it down and all of a sudden out from behind the pile of weeds came about 27 gophers they're jumping out and running off <laughs> the gophers are running around <laughs> i mean we didn't even know we had gophers in the backyard that gophers are running around under the garage about 27 of them come flying out see so he says, crime any sake, Schwartz, turn it off quick. So we turn it off. The gophers are scattering. Have you ever seen gophers? You don't know what a gopher looks like? Oh, sure you do. A gopher looks like a kind of hyperthyroid rat. It's kind of like a nervous rat. <laughs> yeah, they're cute. Gophers are really cute. See? Yeah, they got a stripe on them and all that. So the gophers running like mad under the garage. Now I've got about 28 gophers under the garage, which is not going to be easy to explain to my old man when he gets home, you know, because... I could see him driving the olds in there, the gophers running out. And what the hell happened today? You know? So uh, Schwartz says, wait a minute. He says, let's give it another shot. You know, the gophers are gone. Maybe the worms are going to come now. So I go down to the ground. You see, I'm down on the ground now, and I've got a big can, a pound, big paint can. I'm going to run around and grab the worms, see? So Schwartz throws the switch, and I'm looking. Nothing. I don't see anything, see? And the weeds are standing up straight. I'm running around wait, looking for the worms. See? And suddenly I realize my shoes are burning. My tennis shoes were actually steaming. I'm not kidding you. My shoes were... There was a smoke coming out of the bottom of my shoes. Now, don't ask me what the electrical reason for this was, but I'm running towards the yard fire. Well, my shoes are burning. When all of a sudden, zap, wowie, from behind a great big... Just like that. You could see his head. The biggest snake I ever saw in my born days came right up next to my mother's clothes ball. Well, he was mad. I mean, he had these two red marbles for eyes. His mouth was about, I'll say, three inches across. He stood up. You know how you see pictures of a hooded cobra? 
This guy was standing up on his, well, they don't have hind legs. I mean, but he was standing up about two and a half feet. He must have been three or four inches thick. Big, thick snake. And his eyes were glowing in his mouth. He was going, ah, ah. She. Well, I want to tell you. You never saw more panic on the back porch. Now we got 27 gophers. We got a rattlesnake. And by the way, just about that time, three moles came out looking madder than hell. I mean, you have never seen a mole that's had a shock when he's down there working away. You know, moles work away, and then all of a sudden, zap, he gets one on the choppers, you know, and out he comes. Well, the moles are coming out, the gophers are coming out, the snakes are coming out. No worms. No worms. I'm telling you the truth. No worms. So I gave up that whole scene. Frank says, no. Nope. I mean, I said, this is propaganda, and uh, as a matter of fact, I'd like to see you get, you know, they pr it probably works when the worms are right near the top, but all I got to say is if you're going to use one of these worm gimmicks, you better come out with a shotgun, because who knows what's going to come out of the earth. I mean, after that point, you know, I never once after that time ever walked across that backyard without feeling a little nervous about what's in there. And it doesn't ever come... Your backyard, right now, you take a look out. If you've got a backyard, you think it's just, you know, weeds out there and a couple of little geraniums? Well, let me tell you this. You have no way of knowing what is living three feet under the surface of that backyard. It can be almost anything, you know? So, uh, you know, of course, uh, uh, hardly anybody really suspects the ground he walks on. I do. Uh, <laughs> after this. And, and uh, I, I've, I've often thought, you know, that, uh, that these... Uh, that these, uh, how should develop kind of a, you take it, you don't think much about it. It's like this guy, you know, the hand reaches down, starts taking his wallet. Now he figures he's safe where he is there. You generally think you are. Which reminds me, by the way, I could tell you a story about that one time. I think I told the story. But you know, speaking of animals, and speaking of uh, gophers and uh, rats, I have a request for a story. I'm going to tell it. I rarely give, you know, take a request for a story. But a couple of days ago, a friend of mine said, listen, there was this cop that was putting his arm on me. And I said, really? He said, yep. I was getting the arm put on me. I was going 374 miles an hour in a 12-mile zone. He said, you know how the fuzz are, very intolerant. And so I said, uh, well, what happened? He said, well, I'm sitting in a car there expecting to get stripped down to nothing, you know. And he says, the cop takes my driver's license. And he says, I don't know how, what made me do it. I says, I'm a friend of Gene Shepard's. Oh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, he says, uh, I says, what do you mean? You said this to the cop? you lucky you didn't get one in the mouth. And he says, uh, no. He says, the cop stood there for a second. He was amazed. He says, really? He says, I never miss him. Handed me back my driver's license. We went down to the local tavern. We hoisted a couple together. We went bowling. He says, to hell with his cop business. We took a two-week trip to Miami Beach. You know, we went over to Nassau, did a little gambling. He said, the whole thing. He says, and it all came out of the fact that I listened to you. I said, well, that's heartwarming. I said, it certainly is. I wish that had happened to me once in a while. I, the opposite has happened to me a couple of times. You know, I said, I'm Gene Shepard. He said, oh, oh, boy. Now I got a live one. And then I... <laughs> You know, it's been the opposite. And uh, he says, you never guess what this cop said. And I said, what did he say? He says, he has a favorite story that he wants you to tell. And I said, well, what will happen if I don't tell it? He says, well, he said that he's going to have to press charges. I said, you mean to tell me that uh, your next 30 days depends on whether I tell a story or not, whether you're going to take a sudden vacation? You know, sit there and learn how to scrub floors and all that stuff? He says, yeah. I said, well, what was his favorite story? I said, uh, I'm curious. And he says, well, I'll tell you. He says, you told a story one time about the guys in the steel belt and how they used to spend their evenings. I said, by George, I did. He says, he liked that story so much that he's thinking of telling the boys down at the station house and maybe, you know, it'll give him something to do when time hangs heavy. I said, Really? I said, all right. Now, are you ready for this story out there? This is the favorite story of this guy. You ready for it? I have to dig it, too, because it, uh, it was a 
one of those things, one of those crazy moments. You know, I've, I've really come to this conclusion. It sounds like a, a terrible cliche. I really, really have come to a conclusion, and uh, I'm being serious here for a minute. And that is, there's no conceivable way that a fiction writer, and I, I'm a fiction writer, you know, I, I know a lot of guys that write. There's no conceivable way that a guy could actually top real life for bizarre experiences. There's no way. Now, you've all probably read or seen stories or movies about life in a big factory. You know, remember these old John Wayne movies? He used to always be a, he was always a big blackie or Ernie or something like that, the, working in Pittsburgh Steel. You remember those stories he used to make? Victor McLaughlin was always working in steel mills. And uh, Pal Bryan worked in a lot of steel mills in those movies. They don't make movies anymore about steel mills. By the way, the movies today rarely make movies about anything that real life people do. Have you ever seen anybody in a movie ever go bowling, for example? I don't recall it at all. <laughs> uh, they just don't do the stuff that people do. Movies. Movies have a life of their own now. And, uh, you know, they have nothing to do with life. And so, uh, but they used to, you see. Guys, guys used to make movies about life. They used to make movies about linemen. I remember Spencer Tracy being a lineman. You remember? Uh, used to, you know, guys that were doing regular jobs, you see. They don't do that anymore. So, nevertheless, uh, I worked in a steel mill. And I've seen movies about steel mills. And they always show the same stuff in movies about steel mills. They show the fantastic open heart thing. And, uh, they used to show the big uh, uh, the ingot mill where they're doing rolling, big rolling. Of... <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Well, this is a part of a steel mill. But a very small part of a steel mill. A steel mill is like well, it's, it's, it's uh, actually more varied than the average city. It's a fantastic place. And it covers, yeah, it, it, uh, for example, I worked in Inland Steel, and uh, they had, at the time I worked there, on one shift, just going in and coming out, there were three shifts a day, and they worked seven days a week. On one shift were 17,000 men. And that's a pretty good size place. And when they would come out, 17,000 guys would come in. In other words, there would be 34,000 guys crossing paths. And then, of course, this would go on all day long, all night long. It's tremendous. I remember these great lines of guys coming out of the mill, and I'd be going in. And they got this kind of sleepy, gray look of guys that have been working all night long in the sheet mill or the coke plant or someplace like that. Well, when I, when I went to the mill, I worked in all kinds of places in the mill. I'm, I, I'm a guy because of the fact that I was a messenger in the beginning. I was in the mail department. And that is not at all like the mail department in an office here in New York. It's a separate thing. It's like being a mailman. And that uh, we used to run all over the mill. We would go from uh, the number two uh, Coke plant down to the number three AC and down through uh, every conceivable department. This is one of the fascinating departments, by the way, is the uh, stores. Just a thing called stores. Now, what is the stores? Well, you know, in, within a big factory like that, a tremendous operation like that, they have what is it, the equivalent of an industrial department store. And so the stores were where you would go to buy a uh, steel helmet. And they had them all up there on dummies' heads. You could pick your type. You know, if you want this nice kind, it kind of comes in the back. Oh, you, you see these big clots, you know, these big clots are standing around trying out. Oh, what do you think of this one, Aki? And he puts it on. Hey, whoa, 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 look at this one. Look at me, a football player. You know, they put them on. Uh, and then they, they'd be trying on safety shoes. And they'd, they'd sell goggles. You could get all kinds of safety goggles and all things like that. Fireproof gloves and asbestos uh, jackets and all kinds of special stuff that you never see outside of a mill. So I used to go into the stores department once in a while. I had a, I had my own helmet, see, because of my requirements, you carry these helmets, you wear these big goggles and stuff, and you wear special safety shoes. So one day, I am sent out by the mill to this little office way out on what they call the, the yard scales, which is way out in Lake Michigan, way out. And this is land that's been built out into the lake, you see. And by the way, this steel mill is not in Gary, nor is it in, uh, in uh, Chicago. This is a mill that's between Gary and Chicago, right on Lake Michigan. In fact, if you've ever taken a train in Chicago, you've had to go right through Inland Steel. It's a gigantic place with great uh, glowing skies. Every night, uh, uh, the skies are 
purple and yellow and green and great flashes of red. And just a, I think there's no place more beautiful in a strange way than a steel mill. The beauty of a steel mill, uh, I, I have uh, never seen anything quite like it. I'll never forget the, the 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when I would be running across what they call the, uh, the uh, High Line Bridge, which is a high metal bridge that went across the canal. And all around me, it's two in the morning, you see, and it's icy cold. And below me is this black water. And I could see, as far as I could see, was this great long strip of open hearts. Open hearts and the Bessemer converter, which was way down at the other end. And you could see all of this reflected in this black water. Tremendous orange and gold and yellow and blue. Just, just magnificent. And the sky above would be black, of course. It's nighttime. But you'd see the underside of the clouds would be flecked with green and blue and yellow. It's kind of like a continual pageant of northern lights above you. And so it's, it's a beautiful place if, you, if you're, if you're uh, attuned to that kind of beauty. And so I, went, I was sent way out to this department. I was going to spend a, 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 an extra day there. They needed an extra guy. And I was going to work from midnight to 8 in the morning. Never been out there. And so I went out on the bus it, within the plant, you see. And then I, I went on foot. I walked out through this long, long, narrow, winding railroad track. All oh, tremendous number of freight cars all on either side of me. Cold, bitter cold. The wind is blowing in from the lake. And I'd pass all kinds of warehouses. And finally I came to this little tiny office that's sitting right on the edge of the frozen lake. The wind blowing past it. And I opened the door. The wind is blowing. It's midnight. And I go slamming in. I'm wearing my corduroy cap at this point. And I've got the earmuffs on. I've got everything. I have the mask over the face. It's about 20 below zero. And sitting in this office, if you can call it, but this is a different kind of office world there, really, are these old grimy desks. I could smell this coffee pot. Men had been sitting in this office three shifts a day. Four guys you know, on each shift would be in this office three shifts a day since probably the turn of the century, boiling coffee in the same coffee pot that never stopped. And they never made it over. They didn't empty it out. What they would do, see, <laughs> they, would, they would just keep it going. They would throw in extra ground, see. They would throw in more water, and you never smelled anything like it. The coffee, this was pure coffee, absolute. These guys drank it black. I mean, so black you could have written letters with it, you know. So they, each guy had his big white mug. They were mugs without handles, you know, the kind you just grab a hold of, like I'm a, they pour it out. So I come walking in, and these four guys look up like this, these grizzled veterans in their corduroy caps and their jackets. And one of them says, yeah, you know, kid? I said, I'm only going to be here tonight. Ah, okay, sit down, kid. He says, I'm Chet. Is that Chester? Uh, what is Stanley? That's uh, Cliff over there. And there's Howie down there. Hi, boys. And so I wave. Pitch black outside. And once in a while, you'd hear a freight train go, <laughs> go roaring past. And you smell the coffee. And so one of them poured me a cup of this stuff, and I started drinking it. See? And they gave me some cards to sort, which was what I was going to do that night. I was supposed to be helping them, just sorting real menial stuff. I put all the green cards in one pile, all red cards in one pile. And they, they were giving these cards, see, and these guys are sitting around eating their sandwiches and talking away. And working. They're, they're putting their stamping things, you know, and they're writing stuff down. Hey, uh, Stash, what about that number 17 on the number 12 scales? You got that 17 carload? Okay, here's the card for it. Back and forth. This is the card. They talked in absolute laconic code. These guys knew their work so well that they didn't even have to explain anything to each other, yeah. They're back and forth. These guys in there, 30 years. Well, now it's 4 in the morning, and I'm beginning to get real sleepy. I'm a kid, you know, I'm not used to staying up all night. These guys had been on the night shift for crying out loud since the Boer War, you know. Oh, yeah, you know, they just get to be in the middle of the day for them, you know. So they whip out, they take out their sandwiches, and I remember this guy, Howie. I, he, he did something I never saw in my life before. Have you ever seen, well, he had what we would call a hoagie bun here now. But a big one. This is about two feet long. He takes the bun, and he takes it in the other hand, a a complete salami. A re, you know, a salami. 
but it's about a foot long, see? So he bites a bite out of the salami, up. He bites a bite out of the bun, up. He chews the two for a minute, lays the bun and the salami down, and he takes <laughs> he takes his canteen, which is actually a thermos bottle, and takes a big swallow of Italian red wine, which he called Dago Red. <laughs> and so he sat there and ate salami, bread, wine. <laughs> salami, bread, wine. Boy, did it look good. And now I'm sitting there with my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. See? <laughs> Talk about an effete snob. You know, these guys really ate. So it's now about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I see Chet, one of the guys. They're, now their whole work is done. See, now they, 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 these guys are so good that they did their whole work in like four hours. The rest of the evening, they could just sit around and play peanut and stuff. See, they got the work done. So Chet takes a bucket of water, sits it by the end of his desk, and then he takes a ruler, which he lays on the desk, hanging half over the desk. And very carefully, on the end of the ruler, he takes a piece of salami from Howie and lays it on the end of the ruler. And they all sit there. Dead silence. And I'm watching. I don't know what's going to go on. What, 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 what are you guys doing? Shh. Shh. Wait a minute. Be quiet, kid. He said. Another one comes, the real quiet, see, from behind, comes out from behind the file cabinet. Up the side of the desk, he goes, you're a file Now he's running around the desk, they're all sitting there, quiet. Sure enough, the mouse spots the salami, he goes, he looks for a long minute, so he's just looking at it. You ever heard a mouse in the dark? He goes, they go like that. The mouse then, very carefully, starts walking out on the ruler. Gets to the end of the ruler, he grabs the salami, turns around and runs back, and he's gone. Howie says, Give it a little more balance. You got it too far over, you stoop. What is it? That's the first. Uh, you, uh, you keep. Let me let me do it. I know how to do it. So he moves the ruler out. Now they're laughing, see, because he, he missed one. See, now it's Howie's turn. So Howie moves it out a little bit further. He very carefully puts a piece of salami up, just tilting, see. We all sit. Be quiet. We sit from there. Shh. Here comes another one. This time from behind the file cabinet. He runs around the room, up the side of the desk. He's sitting on the desk now. Shh. He moves to the edge of the desk. I mean, it was like being on safari. I mean, waiting. He's now halfway out on the roller. The crucial moment. Zap! Down into the water he goes. <laughs> and the mouse, ah, he's swimming around. Now he's hanging onto the edge of the bucket. See, looking out. <laughs> and with that, Howie, he's got a slate. You see, the slate that they marked all the slag heap things that would go past there. Mirror. He just writes on it, one. Howie. <laughs> it was their nightly battle. Howie, what? It's now Stash's turn. Stash very carefully puts the ruler up. He lays that he lays that piece of salami there. Now it is Stash that's up, see? We wait. Now, there's three mice up there on the top, see? I couldn't believe it. Two mice together ran out on that damn ruler. Zap! Two of them in there. <laughs> Stash says, ah, oh, double, a double. That's the second one this week. He writes down two. <laughs> a double. Now they got three mice in the bucket. <laughs> and then Howie says, you want to deal with, you want to deal a kid in? This was it. I didn't realize that they're gambling. These guys put ten bucks a night on who is going to get the most mice. What a sporting event. You know, I mean, it was really exciting. And I got very little dose. He says, well, I'll just watch. You know, he says, well, that's smart. He says, I says, I'll just, is, it, is it running now? Well, I'll bring it up there. So I says, I'll just stay out of it, see, you know. But 
for three nights running. They battled it out. It was like the World Series. I might tell you this. I never saw anybody who came close to Stash. Stash Janacek. Fantastic performer. Wouldn't that be a great bit for the ABC's wide, wide world of sports? And now this is Jim Jim, broadcasting you from the number two scale yards in Inland Steel, where the international sports... <laughs> in full color, brought to you coast to coast. So, uh, you know, try to think a good thought over the weekend. For those of you that like to try this little sport at home, it's not as easy as it sounds. It takes a fine touch. You've got to have patience, guts, verb, and of course your lab will be attacked too. So, 